Thank you. So today we, we heard a lot of things about this marvelous observation of uh, this first binary neutron star merger in gravitational waves and a lot of electromagnetic counterparts. Here the GRB is the gamma ray burst, but also we saw a kilonova and then we are still seeing the afterglow 1000, more than 1000 days after merger. So I want to discuss about estimating the Hubble constant. This is the outline of the talk. First, some things about cosmology and the Hubble constant. And as Marius Kalomenoblo said, the Hubble trouble. Then a few things about measuring the Hubble constant from gravitational waves alone. What we need then and how we can use electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational waves in order to use it for the Hubble constant. Then I will go to modeling the afterglow how we can model the afterglow from neutron star mergers. I will briefly discuss about a new observation that just came uh, some months ago. And then I will combine the gravitational wave uh, Hubble constant estimation together with the electromagnetic counterpart afterglow modeling to have a better constraint to the Hubble constant. During the talk, I want to raise two questions and answer to this question because there are a lot of people in the literature, in the community that model afterglow with hydron and other people that uh, model the afterglow with magnetized jets. And I want to argue that they are really different. And the other question is, is this difference really important? And in both questions, the answer is yes. So they are really different and it is really important. And this will lead us to the better estimation in the Hubble constant. So we heard a lot from uh, Marius Kalomenopoulos about the cosmology and the Hubble constant. There are a lot of uh, experiments out there trying to nail down the actual value of the Hubble constant. This is the evolution of the constraints in the last 15 uh, or more years. You can see that 20 years ago, the, the values were really close to each other and within the error bars. Nowadays, they are not. And if you put all the experiments together, you have this Hubble trouble slide taken from Marius Kalomanopoulos. Now, if we go to the gravitational waves alone, uh, this is what LIGO Virgo collaboration gave us as the posterior probability for the Hubble constant. You see that both the experiments of Plug and Schuss are within the errors, but the errors, sorry, from the gravitational wave alone are really, really huge. So we need something to uh, reduce these errors. Mario showed us how we can do it with multiple observations, even without electromagnetic counterparts. I want to show you how we can do it, even if we have only one or two observations, but with electromagnetic counterparts. Now, what's the problem with gravitational waves? And we have such huge errors. So as you can see from this plot, this is the posteriors that I took straight from LIGO and Virgo. There is this degeneracy between the viewing angle and the distance. So without knowing the viewing angle, so the viewing angle for the binary is the inclination angle, uh, we cannot have a good estimation in the distance. And this is what propagates to the Hubble constant. So we need to break this degeneracy. And how we can break this degeneracy is by finding the exact viewing angle from other observations. And the electromagnetic uh, counterpart observations and the modeling of these observations can be really good to nail down the viewing angle. And as you can see, by really uh, finding the viewing angle, you can uh, really have a really good constraint on the distance and uh, as a, a result to the Hubble constant. Now, if we leave the uh, cosmology and the Hubble constant for some time, I want to discuss about what happens uh, after two neutron stars merge. So we heard uh, a lot of things and uh, nice introductions from the previous speakers. Here I want to focus in the higher massive neutron stars, the disk in the ejected matter that we have during this time of the evolution. So when these two neutron stars merge, firstly, if we assume there is no prompt collapse, there is a hypermassive neutron star alive there that produces an enormous amount of ejected matter. First of all, dynamically ejected as they spiral and merge, and then neutrino-driven winds and magnetic winds. So this is the hypermassive neutron stars. This is uh, XZ uh, uh, slice in 18 milliseconds after merger. 
on top it's the density, below is the magnetic field which goes out to 10 to the 16 Gauss, the strength of the magnetic field. Now this hypermassive neutron star, at some point it will collapse. The previous speakers made a really good point of how and when these things happen and how we can measure things. But when this hypermassive neutron star collapses to a black hole, we expect that the relativistic jet will be uh, born. This relativistic jet now has to drill through all this ejecta that was previously uh, ejected, all this matter, and it needs to break out, have enough energy to break out from this ejecta in order that we can observe it in uh, the electromagnetic spectrum now. In this specific case, the first binary neutron star mergers, we had a delay of uh, a delay from the gravitational waves merger point to the first um, gamma ray observation from the gamma ray burst. There was a delay of 1.74 uh, seconds. So we analyzed this and we found that in order for this to happen, you need the, the, the hypermassive neutron star to collapse in around one second. So you need some time for the hypermassive neutron star to eject a lot of matter that we saw in the kilonova. And also you need some time for the jet to drill through the ejecta so that you can see it as a gamma ray burst. Now, going back to numerical relativity simulations, what has been established in the literature is that if you leave two neutron stars to in spiral in the last few orbits and merge and leave um, and put a binary that uh, total mass will quickly uh, make the remnant the hypermass in the star to collapse to a, to a black hole, you have this accretion disk uh, around the black hole and you have this magnetically uh, born structure on top of the um, uh, black hole. Of course, the status in the literature is that an outflow is born that has 0.5 C. So this is not a relativistic jet yet. But the problem is that this simulation lasts only some milliseconds. And as I argued before, the hypermassive neutron star uh, collapsed in around a second, at least for this case, and then it took it a lot of uh, hundreds of milliseconds to drill through the ejecta. So you cannot do such a simulation with numerical relativity. It's just simply impossible numerically. I mean, the cost of this is impossible. So what we did is, on the right, I, I list some details from the simulations we have performed. We start from the black hole. So we imagine we are far uh, later in time when the hypermassive neutron star has collapsed already. We build around the black hole realistic merger ejecta inspired from numerical relativity simulations. And then we have two different runs. In one, we let the magnetic field inside the disk to build and uh, generate a self-consistent jet. In the other case on the left, we put by hand a hydrojet. This is really common in the GRB community and that's, this is why we do it. In the hydro case, you can prescribe by hand what is the opening angle of the jet, this half opening angle of the core. As you can see, the hydrojet propagates through the merger ejecta and still um, uh, preserves an, a really energetic core within the five degrees. Whereas the MHD, in the MHD case, the MHD jet, which is self-consistently uh, launched from the ejecta and the magnetic field initially imposed to them, you can see that it has an opening angle of 10 to 15 degrees and it has a hollow cone. So the energy drops close to the axis in these three, five degrees close to the axis. And also there is no, uh, there is no much acceleration in this neighborhood. Now I show the, the density profile for the hydro case and the MHD case. The, the important point I want, to make uh, I want to make here is that in the MHD uh, case, you don't have only the Z, but you have also a really strong MHD wind. So you continuously eject matter even after the hypermassive neutral star is formed. And this is matter from this uh, residual accretion disk around the black hole. And this can have a really significant contribution, sorry, especially to the red kilonova. Now, we perform simulation, the community performs simulations. How can we model observation? The standard afterglow model says that after your jet drills out from the ejecta or from the star, if you have a long GRB, 
But when you drill uh, and you break out from the merger ejecta, you start hitting the ISM. You pile up matter and gradually, when this matter uh, has as much energy as the jet itself, the jet will start to decelerate. So the shock that is produced during all this evolution is continuously emitting synchrotron radiation. The viewing angle is the angle that we have uh, when observing from the axis of the jet, and the jet opening angle is the half opening angle of this cone. So this is a standard procedure in the literature. So these two plots are taken from Nakar and Piran, and they have gathered uh, a lot of semi-analytical and simulations uh, results from the literature. On the, on the right, you can see some details from this. Usually people start from 10 to the 9, so they, have, uh, they do relativistic calculations or relativistic simulations far from the black hole, and they launch a jet by a hydrodynamic jet. On top, you can see theta obs is the viewing angle, and below is the jet opening angle. These are results when fitting the afterglow data from the radio to the optical to the X-rays. And this is the results that we have found in the literature. Now, another thing that is really important is that uh, we had some VLBI observations and they observed super, super luminal motion of the flux and droid of, this, uh, of the jet. So we had observation in 17 days and 230 days. And this is really important because this can better constrain the models. So you have two things the afterglow itself, but also this VLBI. And these are only the VLBI observations. So these three models are the only models that take into account this VLBI constraint. And you can see what they find is a jet opening angle of 30 degrees and a viewing angle of 16, of 16 degrees. Now going back to our modeling, we continued the previous 2D two-dimensional setup that I showed in three dimensions, and we have a GRMHD jet, a jet that comes from the black hole and the magnetic field and the ejecta profile around the black hole that breaks out from the ejecta. On the left, you can see magnetization. The contour of magnetization one is the white line. In the middle is the density profile that you can see the jet and the ejecta at this point. And on the left is the Lorentz factor. Again, in 3D, uh, we confirmed our findings of the 2D case that the opening angle of MHD and uh, specifically here GRMHD jets self-consistently launched, uh, the, open, the opening angle is more than 10 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, and there is a hollow cone, so the energy drops close to the axis. Now, with this, this observation, we can go and model the afterglow. These are, on the left, afterglow observations, on top, radio observations at 6 gigahertz, and below, uh, X-ray observations. Of course, to do the fitting, we have used all the available uh, observation exists. You can see that the last X-ray point that I saw here goes till 900 days after the merger. So we fit our 3D model in this afterglow data. We also do the VLBI constraint of the superluminal motion. In the middle, you can see the posterior distribution from our fitting procedure, and this is the, the centroid motion in milliard seconds. And on the left, you can see the viewing angle that we find, which is around 20 degrees far from all the other results. As you can understand, there is a big difference because the hydro jets have a really energetic core from the axis, whereas the MHD jets that uh, we have simulated have a hollow cone on the axis and really energetic wings. Now, this uh, key and part on the far right of the afterglow data is the expected radio, uh, radio signal from the ejecta. When I mean ejecta is, as I showed before, we have a jet from the simulation, but also we have an MHD wind. This wind has a velocity of 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 times the speed of light. So this, when the jet has already decelerated, this MHD wind at some point will cut up the decelerated jet and most probably will rebrighten uh, the shock and will uh, may have some uh, brightening of the emission. So because we don't know the details of the microphysical parameters, we plotted this whole uh, mountain here. What is really important is and nice is that in the last uh, two, three months, Two groups claim that we saw 
uh, a new observation in the X-rays in 1,200 days later, and it seems that it, the, the flux is rising. So I would say that this can be really consistent with the rebrightening of the shock from the MHD wind that now has cut up uh, the decelerated jet. 15 minutes, I'm done. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no time. So I will briefly discuss about this and I will finish. So uh, from our modeling, the, here I saw, I, I, I saw how the distance is correlated with the viewing angle. So from the afterglow modeling from jets, you can really precisely uh, find the viewing angle, but you don't know a lot of things for the distance because the distance is correlated with the energy of the jet. Now, if you combine this with the gravitational wave observation, you can have a region and you can nail down better the Hubble constant. So if now we use as priors the, the information from the, uh, the gravitational waves, you, we can have a better constraint in the distance from the viewing angle constraint of the jet. And this can uh, significantly improve the estimation of the Hubble constant. Sorry for rushing in the last few slides. So this is the last slide. So I wanted to ask to answer these two questions. Hydro and magnetized sets are really difficult, uh, really uh, different. I hope I persuaded you that this is the case. And indeed, they are really different. First of all, in the shape of the jet and in the imprint that they have on the afterglow emission, especially in the viewing handle, but also in the amount of mass that it is ejected which can be really important for the kilonov observations, one, two days after merger, but also for the late time afterglow observations. And is this difference really important? Yes, this is really important because it can uh, uh, drive us to different and better estimation for the Hubble constant. Thank you and sorry for being late. Thank you, Andoni. We do have time for one quick question to Andoni. Okay, uh, Marius. Marius, we cannot hear. Marius, can you hear? Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, I think Marius cannot hear us, but I okay. did see a My second sorry. hand. Uh, Spiro? No. Oh. Spiro, you can ask your question. Marius muted himself again. Okay, I see what the problem was. Now you can unmute yourself. I'm sorry, that was me. Uh, please go ahead, Spiro. Okay, yes, hi. So, uh, I mean, at the end, combining these two methods, what is the value of, of the Hubble constant that, that, that you find and the corresponding error bars? Thank you. Yes, so I didn't want to, to, to say something about these values. I have some preliminary results, but uh, I will uh, keep them for myself for the moment, but I can let you know when we have the results. So right now we are trying to, to find, uh, to, to, to develop a, a novel algorithm in order from the data to establish and understand if the the jet was hydro or MHD and then report uh, the most consistent Hubble constant. Um, my, I think you can unmute now. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Okay, yes, yes, how it works, thanks. Uh, actually, I had a similar question with um, Spiros. Uh, uh, so from the observations, I couldn't get which one of the hydro or the MHD would be the most, uh, uh, you know, the one that uh, we have there. And uh, maybe, maybe a very basic question. So I thought that magnetic fields would always uh, play a role. So can you just neglect them? And just use hydro? I mean, come on. 
I did the MHD analysis. I, I believe that you cannot neglect them, but it seems that in the community there are a lot of people that do hydro simulations, and this is okay for the for the gamma ray burst uh, modeling. Now, of course, if we go to neutron stars, we all know that they have magnetic fields and strong magnetic fields, and also in the literature it's known that there is a a huge magnetic field amplification in the first milliseconds of murder. So for sure there is magnetic field, but it would be really nice if we could find this from the observational data, from the afterglow and the VLBI. So if we could prove that the MHD fits better the data than the hydro. And then, because the already exists in the literature a Hubble constant from the hydro case, so you can see here that they found 16 degrees and these are the values from the hydrojet, but for us the Hubble constant can be slightly higher than this result because we go further down in the viewing angle. So I do believe that the MHD case is more accurate. 